Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our panelists to the stage. And uh, thank you so much once again for joining us for our special forum to commemorate the 100th year of anniversary of Korean cinema. Now we have on our panel today academics from all over Australia. Greg is based in Sydney, Russell is based in Melbourne, and John is based in Brisbane, and we have Niall from Perth. So, um, yeah, uh, reputed Korean cinema academics all the way from the all corners of Australia joining us today to share their insights about the history, the present, and future of Korean cinema. So without further ado, I think I might give a short introduction, and if you could let us know afterwards um, just how you came to find out about Korean cinema and how you decided to pursue more knowledge into the field. So I'll start with Greg. Now, Dr. Gregory uh, Dolgopolov is senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales on film studies. And um, Greg, how did you first come across Korean cinema? Um, I, I'm a total ring in here. I, I'm not a specialist on Korean cinema, but I'm a huge fan. And so uh, I think it's thanks to you. I think I attended the second film, uh, Korean Film Festival, and I've been going ever since. And uh, I'm actually quite angry with Korean cinema. And, um, and I'd like to share this anger with you because I've never seen a bad Korean film. And so I'm a little bit disappointed with the Korean Film Festival because you've never screened a bad film. And um, well, no, I, I'm you know seriously, I, I'd like to you know, at least uh, sort of a sidebar of bad Korean cinema. I'm sure there are some, but uh, you you failed to screen any. So uh, I, I've uh, genuinely enjoyed you know three or four films that I've seen every year um, for the past nine years. So I'm, I'm really grateful to the Korean Film Festival for. Uh, bringing Korean uh, cinema to, to Australia and you know uh, revealing something that I probably only had a sort of an inkling of a, in a broad kind of genre sense, but um, realised it's so much bigger and so many um, serious and big themes that are explored, and so yeah, remarkable. And yeah, I just want to uh, re uh, point out that Greg has been part of our festival since the second year, so nine years uh, he's been supporting us every year. And yeah, it's much appreciated. And thank you for being here. Uh, could we give a round of applause for Dr. <laughs> our second panelist is Russell Edwards. Uh, Russell Edwards has also been with our festival for a very long time, from the first? Not the first, I'm mm. second or third. Second or third, second yeah. Third, yes. Yeah. He's quite a fan. <laughs> so a uh, reputed film critic. Uh, he wrote for Variety magazine and is an advisor to the Busan International Film Festival and uh, also an avid lover of Korean cinema. So if you could let us know your journey as well, that would be great. Okay, well, mine's, there's kind of two parts to my journey. One was, uh, I was working at a film creek. I went to the Hong Kong Film Festival in 1996, the year before the handover, and Hong Kong was kind of winding down. And uh, I was at a party and all these kind of uh, guys came in very sleek, suits and started handing around their business card and they said we're from the Pusan Film Festival and we're having our first festival uh, later this year, we would really like you to come. And I didn't know it then, but I was what I was witnessing was the, the pivot from Hong Kong, which used to be the centre of Asian cinema, to Korea. Um, and it took me four years to get to Pusan and I kind of went and I really didn't know very much. I'd seen one Korean film before I arrived in Busan. But every day in 1999, uh, the film opened, the festival opened with Peppermint Candy, the Lee Chong Dong film. Um, and I saw uh, Art Museum by the Zoo, uh, Shiri, and the one that put the hook in me was Nowhere to Hide. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the thing about, and it was also Jang Sung Woo's uh, Lies. And the thing for me was that not only were these films good, but they were all different from each other. And that really indicated to me that this was a really vibrant film culture. So I decided I would go back to Pusan, and I've been going back every year ever since. And as David said, I'm now an advisor to the Pusan Film Festival on Australian and New Zealand films, not on Korean films. 
Thank you, Russell. Um, so if we could just welcome Russell as well. Joining us all the way from Brisbane is uh, Mr. Jong Soon Kim, or John, would you prefer? <coughs> yeah, it's John, yeah. John, John, okay. And John, you are the course coordinator for the Korean drama, contemporary Korean drama and film uh, reflection, was it? Uh, it can be whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> At the University of Queensland. Yeah. So um, I believe that you are Korean. Yes. <laughs> but Absolutely. please do tell us how you got uh, more academically involved in Korean cinema. Uh, so, first step, uh, I was born in Korea. <laughs> Fair that enough. makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, my life never really began, or my uh, academic life never really began with Korean cinema. It was just, um, first of all, it was just like a part time. Um, job at UQ uh, as a tutor for a cultural subject um, called uh, Korean popular culture, so Hallyu or the Korean way. Um, but then there was another course that was uh, set up um, which was Korean contemporary Korean, contemporary Korean um, film and drama um, and I was told to take over that as well. So that sort of half forced me to get into Korean cinema. But it's interesting because what I deal with is probably different from um, these academics here, is my focus is more on the cultural, the ideological representations in the films that we teach to the students rather than the film itself or the direction or you know, the cinematography. Um, and so I think I'll probably be bringing a different scope uh, to this forum. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, if we could please welcome John to our forum as well. Last but not least, and uh, I guess geographically um, the furthest from me, and very represented so in this panel as well, all the way from Perth, uh, please welcome Dr. Niall McMahon. Yes, please tell us. So my story is a bit different from all you three because it's both simultaneously lengthy but crushingly dull to listen to. So pretty much my journey really began because I remember way back when I was in high school, my mum actually bought me a DVD copy of The Host. So one of the very rare Australian releases for a Korean film. I watched it, I enjoyed it, put it on the shelf, completely forgot about it, went away. A few years later, I came across the Korean remake of the Hong Kong classic A Better Tomorrow on just, I think, Amazon, I believe. Watched the film and was like, oh, how quaint, you know, his Korea, you know, such a small nation, not a whole lot of film industry going on, remaking such a classic. That's quite interesting. Watched it, put it away. Now I'm looking back on that, just seeing how wrong I was about that entire thing. But yeah, then one day, just pretty much browsing Amazon UK, which was pretty much gave me my livelihood right now, basically decided to buy Old Boy and The Good, Bad, The Weird one day. Just out of the blue, got home, watched them. Love them both, and pretty much I was actually in the same boat as you, Greg, going, I have never seen a bad Korean film ever. It's so great. I've since learned differently. You will too, don't worry. But no, it was basically from that I just built that love of Korean cinema. I just sought out every single one that they had available. Uh, my favorite Korean film, Public Enemy, uh, directed by Kang Woo Sai, was actually available from that. So it pretty much grew just organically, just from completely stumbling into this thing. So by the time I actually got a chance to do my PhD at Curtin University in WA, I pretty much had the idea of, I want to do about Korean cinema. I have no idea what, I have no idea what subject, what angle, whatever, I just wanted to be on Korean cinema. And so from there, I pretty much researched the hell out of everything I could, and well, here I am today. So it just pretty much grew out of, well, stumbling into it, stumbling upwards. Mm, so, mm, definitely, well, what a, what a story. Um, let's welcome Niall, Dr. Uh, we've introduced all our panelists, but before we now fully go into the forum, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this place we now call Sydney. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future, and pay my respects to all Aboriginal people here today, wherever you may come from. So, um, delving into the first question, and I'll, if, uh, please forgive me for looking at my notes on my phone, but, uh, so, 1919 
was the first year for Korean cinema. And in 1919, some of you may know this, only about six films were produced from the country. Fast forward 100 years from then, we now have a, no, 600 Korean films projected to be released domestically, which is almost exactly 100 times that number. Um, what do you think are some of the things that have allowed us to achieve this growth, um, just in terms of government policies or just in terms of the social norm and things like that? Um, I think the history of Korean cinema is um, an expertise from Dr. McMahon and Russell, Mr. Edwards. So um, maybe a recommendation for you to kick off the panel. Cool. Okay, well, I'll start on that one. But to understand Korean cinema, to see where it actually is today, you have to go way back to, well, even before 1919, because the history of the entire cinema is just full of contention and conflict and just political uprisings and all that, okay? So, in fact, the beginning of Korean cinema, even though we do prescribe it to 1919, it actually has multiple different dates all throughout well, the last hundred years. We can actually really cling to and go, this is where it definitively began, especially for where we are today. So way back in 1893, going all the way back there, our cinema itself was actually first introduced on the Korean Peninsula by England missionaries, basically trying to spread the Western ideology and the word of God and everything like that. But from there, the Korean people really latched onto it. They were climbing over fences, trying to find these films, really interested in what this well, moving image thing actually was. So from there, in 1919, which was the production of the first Kino drama, I believe, which was The Righteous Revenge, it was essentially a play where they had film segments played behind them. So people were playing out play, and they had film segments as their sets, and along like that. Then, if we really want to get pedantic about it, the very first full film was made in 1923 with the silent film, uh, what was it, Plighted Love Under the Moon. So that was the very first official feature length film, if you will. Then if you want to keep going from that, we have 1946 with the production of Hurrah for Freedom, which was the very first Korean film produced outside of the Japanese occupation. So pretty much the very first example of free Korean cinema outside of Japanese control. And then keep going if you want to go to 1954 when they removed taxation from the industry entirely after the Korean War with the post-war reconstruction era with the story of Chung Yang, I believe it is. That's the very first, well, golden age film of Korean cinema as we do come to know it. Then going way forward to about 1996 when all governmental censorship and oversight and everything was removed from the industry. That was basically where the birth of creative expression for modern Korean cinema was actually created. So what we know today of Korean cinema actually essentially birthed from well, 1996. But to essentially talk about where we got, like how we got to where we are today, there are two main parts that we need to talk about. It was the national security law, which was put in in 1948, which was essentially all about well, anti-communist doctrine, pretty much hardcore anti-communist, you can't have any pro-North Korean Japanese sentiment at all. You have to idolize the South Korean ideology. But from there, the South Korean government essentially put it on to the doctrine going, we can use film as some form of propaganda tool. Let's put all our ideologies into that, put it in the people's face, get them to basically adopt our ide ideology wholesale. So from there, it was pretty much birthed and embedded into Korean cinema, uh, the Korean cultural psyche essentially from the very beginning. Then we do have the motion picture law introduced in 1962, which introduced the uh, screen quota system, which essentially, if you don't know what that is, is, was that they can only, they have to film, screen a number of South Korean films, locally made South Korean films, for a mac minimum number of days per year. So for instance, I think it's not about 30 days, or it's about 160, things like that. They had to show these Korean films for that many days. So from that, you cultivated a very loyal, cinematic audience from the very beginning of that cinema. So not only was it being pushed by the government, it was being pretty much pushed by all the studios, so you have it embedded in their culture, in their psyche, you got that you know, loyal audience going from there. So when, in 1996, we finally got, you know, basically no censorship going on whatsoever, it boomed. So the top highest grossing Korean films of all time were all released after 2003, and mentioning Shiri, which was Korea's first blockbuster, it actually outgrossed Titanic in their domestic box office. So from that whole big history, we can actually see where they are today, how we got to this point, where they are. 
600 films, and, well, hopefully we've all seen Parasite here, but that's more or less the pinnacle, and we're going from strength to strength, I believe. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, Russell, did you have? Yeah, I'd like to add a couple of things to that. I mean, as Niall said, you know, I, th I think cinephilia is just a really important part of um, the passion for Korean film within Korea, and you know, and that was evident, you know, right from the beginning. You know, when uh, film was introduced in the eighteen nineties, and you know, Koreans really embraced and what have you. But you know, one of the things that really strikes me about when I go to Busan is how cine literate Koreans are, and how impassioned they are, not just about Korean cinema but cinema generally. So I think that's kind of a, a key thing. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the things I like to pull out is, because uh, as you said, there's kind of a series of false starts with Korean cinema in lots of ways, uh, and particularly with the a Righteous Revenge and the films up until 1946, it's like, well, is it Korean? Because it was all Japanese controlled. So is it a Korean film or is it not a Korean film? And all that kind of stuff. And with the Righteous Revenge, kino dramas, the play, is it even really a film? You know, there's, so there's all that kind of discussion. But the, one of the things is in 1994, there was a government report from the Committee of uh, Science and Technology, and big report, and one of the things that they um, centred on, or that they noted, was that uh, when Jurassic Park was made, that uh, Jurassic Park made three times as much money as the annual output for, or almost three times as much annual output of Hyundai cars. And so it's a very risky kind of logic, but they went, okay, so if we make films, we make popular films, we can bring a lot of money into the country. And so they, you know, funded, they supported the film industry in a very big way. Now, you know, the whole idea of like, yeah, we can just do this, you know, it's kind of very risky strategy. However, Samsung and uh, Daewoo and whatever, uh, you know, they started funding films, and Shiri, as uh, Nail said, um, you know, topped Titanic, which became a news story right around the world. So the whole world sort of kind of went, because I, I remember noticing on page seven of the Sydney Morning Herald. So the whole world kind of, because it went on the wires, the whole world became aware of Korean cinema being really popular. Nobody had seen, nobody outside of Korea had seen a Korean film, but we were aware, you know? Um, and so, and. So I think cinephilia and blind faith in lots of ways, you know, like we can do this and we will do this, and they did. It's just incredible. Um, and I think, you know, I also believe that, you know, and this might uh, be brought in by John as well, but the kind of cultural ambitions of Korea once, um, you know, the dictatorships were put to rest. So from the Olympic Games, the Asian Games, the World Cup, it's all this kind of soft power thing that kind of comes in. The Korea says, okay, we're, we've had a thousand years of having our head down, we've arrived, we're, we're coming. And so I think that, you know, it's all part of that wider strategy of, Korea, of South Korea. And I think it's very apparent that uh, from uh, Russell and Niles' points that Korean cinema has definitely gone through a change and a shift in tone and ideologies over these hundred years. I mean, it would be weird if it didn't, to be honest. Um, I want to ask, John, um, you have kind of seen the trends from the past until the contemporary Korean cinema. Um, the pressing question, I guess, we should derive that is, are these changes in tones and ideologies a byproduct of society, or has, is it the other way around? Have these, has cinema cultivated to the change in society the other way around? Um, I think, uh, mostly I think it is the byproduct of society, but then there's also the other way, there's some uh, evidence to uh, the other way around as well, but uh, if you look at the history, as uh, the panelists have mentioned, Korea has gone through immense changes in history. Um, opening of forced opening of the um, of Korea Peninsula sports to Japan, which um, sort of uh, uh, I, I don't want to use the word helped, but it, uh, sort of brought in uh, modernization into Korea. Uh, uh, from then the uh, the colonization, the oppression, but whilst they were doing that, Japanese were bringing their technology into sort of you know 
developed Korea, not for the Koreans' benefit, for their benefit, but, but uh, the Koreans so. did receive it on their territory. Um, after that, you've got the liberation, but you know, after the liberation, only about um, right after liberation, the, the Korean Peninsula was divided um, by the Soviets and by the, Ameri by the Americans. And so now you've got North Korea being um, dictated by um, communist um, dictatorship, um, South Korea being ruled by a um, capitalist um, democratic government um, under uh, Sung Man Rhee, who was educated in America. Uh, after that, you've got the Korean War. Uh, after the Korean War, you've got Sung Man Rhee's despotic regime. After that, and then you've got the two military dictatorships, um, one after another. They all have different um, emphasis on, um, on culture, how they want to use the film as propaganda. Uh, and then after that, you've got, as uh, you mentioned, 1993, uh, the election of Kim Young-sam, Kim Young probably the beginning of um, cinema without any sort of censorship. Um, and then you've got today. Um, and if you look at all the films during those periods, you can see that most of the films actually reflected the society and the environment then. So for example, um, after the liberation, you've got a lot of these liberation films that have been that are that are being um, made. Um, the stories that rotate around um, like um, the mar the martyrs, the freedom fighters like Yung Bong Gil and so on. After that, uh, you've also during this period um, after the separation from um, the division between South and North Korea, you've also got films in South Korea, uh, most of uh, many of them that have been focused on anti-communism. Um, and so from then, even from this point, you've got films that are focusing on anti-communism. Um, and so would these films have been produced if Korea wasn't divided? Highly unlikely. Um, and so uh, even from the beginning and moving on to the dictatorship because of the censorship, I think because of the censorship, especially I think um, uh, Chun Du Wan's regime actually um, teaches us a lot about it. You know, his uh, implementation of the three S's, sports, screen, and sex, that really allowed Korean cinema, uh, well, it's not allowed, but it sort of pushed Korea into a new direction of cinema uh, where you know, many scholars would paint the 1960s as the, the, um, the highlight or the, the climax of Korean cinema. Whereas during the 1970s, you got um, um, a lot of films that have been pro uh, produced around um, hostess films, uh, prostitute films, sort of um, moving on to now sort of the lewd adult type films. Um, and then. And then after um, that, when we go into the Chanduan era, the three S's, it just becomes full on. It's no longer just hostess, post, uh, prostitutes. It's now just focusing on lust of the women. Um, and I think one of the most popular films uh, the Koreans know is called the Emma Wife or Emma Gui. Um, it's an adult film, um, which apparently was so popular that people um, would break windows just to get in and have a watch. Uh, it's, uh, it's led to about 13 unofficial sequels. Um, I don't know, I haven't watched any of them, so. <laughs> My wife's there, so. <laughs> so I haven't watched any of them, so. Uh, but then after that, you've got, uh, after the dictatorship and ends from Kim Yong Sang, Kim Yong Sang, almost without the censorship, you've got films that have now been um, widely recognized, like Chidi, JSA, um, but then all, what these films have in, um, uh, in common is that they center around North and South Korean relationships. And uh, if you look at even today, the, the really popular films, I mean, if you go to um, Google, Wikipedia, look at the highest grossing film in Korean history, is uh, the, gen, uh, the Admiral, Roaring Currents, Myungyang. And of course, it was a brilliantly made film. But I think more people went to go watch it because it was released at a time where, it is still today, that Korea and Japan were at this weird um, conflict uh, in regards to territorial disputes and so on. And that um, is a reason uh, I think um, the films uh, produced is they reflect the society, they reflect the, reflect the times, uh, the environment, the mood. Um, and I think uh, even Parasite, I think, has, uh, we'll probably talk about Parasite, but I think uh, the release of Parasite is also uh, one of the evidence to show that uh, it is released as a byproduct of society rather than the other way around. Yeah, well, thank you for that in-depth um, run through, John. And you mentioned um, Parasite, and I guess I want to kind of expand a bit further on that film because obviously it's the talk of the year. Um, Parasite taking home the 
Palm d'Or at Cannes this year is, I guess, phenomenal for Korean cinema. And what a better, what, and what a better year for it to receive this on the 100th anniversary of Korean cinema. Um, I want to ask our panelists today what that win signifies for Korean cinema and how that would project it onto the future, um, whether in terms of international recognition for Korean cinema, or in terms of, I guess, the domestic production of more outhouse films that would cater to that mainstream audience. Because, yeah, I feel that what this film did was kind of bridge the gap between people who seek art house and people who seek mainstream. Um, people would come up to me and say things like, wow, um, that new Korean film called Parasite um, sounds really interesting. Is it, does it have monsters? Does it have actual aliens like parasites come in and take over people? That's what people were thinking about this film. And um, I, it was just very interesting to see that audience come together for this one film. And, I'm wondering um, what your take yeah, can is on I, Can I jump in here um, yes. and say that I, I think that for many people it's, uh, an, it's an opportunity to catch up with what's happening in, in Korean cinema over the past 10 years. So um, th this uh, is probably a kind of a, a late crowning and we'll hopefully um, uh, ask people to have a look at a back catalogue of um, uh, not only the director of Parasite but uh, of his peers and his colleagues. So uh, in some ways that Whereas it's a crowning for now, but it should also uh, cause a, a point of reflection for, for the past, and so people you know, catch up. But I'm sure people who follow art house cinema are well versed in, in the, the great Korean filmmakers of the past 20 years. I'm going to um, follow up on that, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial about this. Now, a lot I, of controversy. Okay, that, that, let me preface this, preface this by saying I adore Parasite, I think it's an amazing film. But I have worked on the film festival circuit and it's kind of, one of the things about this is that I, I'm convinced that this would be very good for Bong Joon-ho. I'm not absolutely convinced it would be good for Korean cinema across the board. You know, um, there's very much this thing of, particularly at Cannes, you know, there's kind of, there's a festival family of filmmakers who have been honoured and what have you. So, you know, Bong Joon-ho, um, got particular attention because he did a midnight preview of The Host in 2006, and it was a, it was a bomb blast at Cannes, you know. Um, so he's had a long kind of relationship um, with the Cannes Film Festival, and I think that also is echoed in the Sydney Film Festival as well, that I, I mean, it certainly helps that it won the Palm d'Or, but I think as far as the Sydney audience is concerned, it's much more about the fact that he was out here for Okja the year before that the groundwork, the PR groundwork had already been done beforehand. Um, so, you know, I, I think the other thing that kind of, how good this will be for Korean cinema, we also have to remember that the year before at Cannes, you know, everyone thought, every major film critic thought that Burning was going to get the palm door. And then right at the last minute, it went to the Japanese director, creator for Shoplifters. Now, and my understanding of why that happened is that you've got all these people who attend the festival every year and pronounce on films that are there and what have you, but you've got a jury who may never have seen a Coriator film before. And Burning, you know, as much as I like that too, it's a very intense film and for a very particular taste. Um, and to me, if you've got a bunch of film people who've never seen a Coriator film before, they go, wow, this is amazing. Whereas everyone else is like, well, yeah, Coriander does this every year. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, you know, and but the kind of byproduct of that was because everyone was saying how good it was, all the sales agents jumped the gun and bought Burning before the prizes were announced. And that's why it got distribution, because it spent their money. Um, and I think that com combined with the win of Parasite could work well for. Korean cinema, but I don't think it's just about Parasite. Um, we have to see how it, how it builds from here. Yeah, well, if I can have a bit more of an optimistic view, I suppose, because coming from WA, pretty much, there are Korean films being shown at least once a month at cinemas. 
And now it seems to have, okay, no, no need to do my own horn here, but I'm very much the one constant at all of these films. And it's pretty much me, whoever I happen to drag along at the time, and maybe two to probably six people else in the audience. Rotating, I don't see a familiar face at any time. At one time it was actually once me and my brother who was on the audience tonight. Uh, basically, we were the only ones in the theater, like entirely. It was ridiculous, actually. Amelia was for her story or her story. That was quite an intense film. But it wasn't a huge turnout, that's the point. But then with the, the um, occurrence of Burning, for instance, uh, it was being shown in an outdoor cinema once. That's when I saw it. And it was packed. The whole place was essentially packed. And then when Parasite came out, I did a talk, you know, a Q&A after Parasite in Perth. And once again, it was packed. And then subsequent, every time we returned to that cinema in the next like, month or so, people were still asking to see Parasite. Like these cinemas were filling up. They were actually, people were coming out to see them. So the fact that they were getting attention, that they weren't just, oh, it's good, but no, they're ringing awards, getting nominated for prizes. I mean, Parasite's just been nominated for that Academy Award for Korea. It's now their nomination for Best International Film at this year's Oscars. But yeah, so just that exposure, the fact that people were then told that they were actually there at all, allowed them to actually come out and see these films. So hopefully, that might actually get people to do what I did and seek them out for themselves, especially for Parasite. It wasn't just director of Snowpiercer and Okja. It was the director of The Host and Memories of Murder and things like that. So it was actually using his Korean films to advertise his films to a Western audience. So hopefully, at least from my personal perspective, that will get people who like the film to seek out those films, watch them, enjoy them, and then hopefully go on IMDb, see the other things being recommended to them, seeking them out as well. Netflix and YouTube have access to so many Korean films and Korean dramas these days. So hopefully that is just the step in the door that people need to be exposed to this well, amazing national cinema. That's probably just me being optimistic about the whole thing. Uh, yeah, if I um, just um, jump in there. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's a good opportunity, but also I think it might be dangerous as well. Um, because Korean cinema is uh, heavily invested by the conglomerates, com uh, companies like CJ, um, uh, the companies that have a lot of money, they, uh, I want to say, uh, like, you know, Bong he's an art house director, so um, he, he's sort of like, no, I'm going to do it my way, it's either my way or the highway. Or, you know. um, uh, apparently, he uh, and um, uh, Robert Weinstein also had a uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein, sorry, um, had an argument about um, a film that Harvey Weinstein wanted to be cut by like 20 minutes, uh, Snowpiercer, I think it was Snowpiercer, yeah, and uh, Bong Joon was like, no, <laughs> it's my film, I'm going to do it my way. Um, directors of his caliber will be able to have that leverage. Um, other directors won't. And the conglomerates, their main motive, um, although most, many of them might love Korean cinema, but you know, it's a business, you do it for the money. And, you, and as these companies sort of look for ways to make money, they'll realize that art house um, investments into art house films isn't the most effective way. It's the so-called uh, the blockbuster, the genre films that actually have more potential to bring in more money. But you'll realize that these Korean genre films, or these romantic comedies, most of them, or actions, aren't internationally recognized. Because why do you watch a Korean one when some one um, that's made exactly the same with, in Hollywood with better, C, better CGI, C, CGI well-known actors um, is just um, shown right at the, at the other screen. Why don't you go watch it? And so I think it's, it might become dangerous because people might um, think Parasite, wow, Korean film is great, all Korean films must be great, let's go watch the next Korean film. And they'll sometimes be disappointed because they'll realize that um, a lot of the Korean cinema at the moment has sort of shifted from being these uh, um, films that have been directed by you know, people like Park chan you know, Bong joon um, these art house directors, um, and then you've got the commercial films, which aren't at that same caliber. Um, and so if the conglomerates start to invest more into these genre films, because on the backdrop of Parasite success, I think it will mean that there are, there are less films by these auto directors and more films by the, the blockbuster um, genre films. So Can I, I think, yeah. come in on that yes. as well. The um, I mean one and then I think what you're saying is completely valid. But it's also while this is mainly centered on Khan, 
you know, we've been in this place before with other film festivals, with other Korean directors, you know. So, you know, uh, Kim ki Duk, who is out of favour now, <laughs> but, you know, in Russia. Yeah, he's well, huge in Russia. Well, I can see that. <laughs> I can see why that would happen. Um, but, you know, like 15 years ago, Kim ki Duk was one of the bright shining lights, awarded by Venice, awarded by Berlin, and, you know, and... I mean, it's also partially to do with artistic decline. I think he lost his way artistically to a certain extent, but also fashion's changed, you know? And, uh, you know, Kim Kyu-duk is one of those directors who's really felt the rough edge of Me Too very much. Um, and it's a pity, because yeah, he was actually getting better as a filmmaker again. Um, so there's that kind of thing. There's also, you know, in Quantec, um, with films in the 80s, you know, uh, where, um, Kang Soo Yeon won prizes at Venice, and you know, so there's kind of been things, you know, Lee Chong Dong's Secret Sunshine with uh, John Dion winning Best Actress Prize, you know. I mean, every time people say, oh, this is it, well, now it's going to happen, and it doesn't necessarily play that way, you know. It's, um, and there is also, like, there is a kind of disconnect between the wider cine cine cinema audience and the film festival world. You know, and as I say, having attended a lot of film festivals, sometimes it's completely baffling how something can be celebrated a masterpiece, and then you see it and go, what were they thinking? You know, whereas, I mean, I think Parasite, to take David's original point, is a film that brings different audiences together. Whether that can keep happening, I don't know. And on the topic of film festivals, um, the Korean Film Festival is in its 10th year this year. And I guess I want to kind of bring the topic to film festivals that are happening around Australia. And I've been speaking to Greg a little earlier this morning, and he mentioned that there was about 10 or 12 film festivals that are happening around this it's period right, yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. So um, the film festival scene is very vibrant here. What do you think the film festival scene does for this Australian landscape? And in the 10 years that we've been here, obviously a lot of things have been changing. Um, uh, and I don't know the rough statistics, but are there roughly the same amount of film festivals that have gone for 10 years, or has it been an incline? Um, and what do you feel these cultural film festivals like ours, and like the Japanese film festival, the Latin film festival, they, these film festivals, what do you feel that they do for the scene here? Um, I, I do the Russian Resurrection Film Festival in uh, November, and we've been going for 16 years this year, so just a little plug. But um, there, probably from about 2005, there was a massive increase in the number of national and cultural film festivals. And, and uh, the, the remarkable thing was, not only were these film festivals emerging, many of them on, you know, without any sort of government sponsorship, but they were, um, they were the largest of their kind anywhere in the world. So the Russian Film Festival in Australia is the largest Russian film festival anywhere outside of Russia, which is kind of perverse. It's not like it's dependent on a, a Russian diaspora to sustain it. So the majority of our audience is not necessarily Russian. And I think uh, that's true for the French Film Festival, that that's the largest uh, national film festival in Australia outside of, um, uh, outside of France, and the, the largest national film festival um, Australia-wide. It uh, gets something like 230,000 people attending every year, which is remarkable. It's, uh, it's bigger than the Sydney Film Festival. Um, I mean, it does run for a lot longer and has you know, broad programming, but it just is a demonstration for it. Uh, it's true for the German Film Festival. There's quite a number of national cinemas that have been the largest of their kind uh, outside of their, their, their country of origin, which points to Australia being a uh, migrant nation, one that is quite accepting of um, different cultures and seeks to learn about other cultures through their cinema, perhaps through their cuisine, perhaps through, you know, we, we try to blend a bit of Russian food with Russian cinema and you know, have a sort of a soft introduction to Russian culture, try to destroy stereotypes at the same time. And I, I suspect that most national cinemas uh, national cultures trying to do the, the same thing. So, uh, but having said that, uh, I think that the film festival landscape is continuously fluctuating. There, there's film festivals that appear and that uh, some disappear. Uh, some film festivals are, are one day events, others will you know, go for, for you know, 10 days. The, the German Film Festival recently has passed over to, uh, away from the Goethe Institute to, to Palace Cinemas. And in a sense, you can see that that's a kind of um, a transition that is uh, there, there's a feeling of a loss of authenticity when the, the cultural foundation that supports it 
kind of gives over control. Um, you know, no matter what you say, you know, it's yes, of course, it's about the films, but it's also about much more than the films, and it's you know, it's trying to capture what, what is that, uh, what's that film culture that that you know, that essence, that mood that occurs in the audience, uh, where people from you know the national culture come together and sort of you know share their experiences. So you know, that that you know the movement of Palace to capturing uh, uh, more of the you know, national film festivals. It's great that they're available. It, uh, the reason that they're available is that you know the uh, mainstream distribution has gone so much away from art house and, and film festivals represent a kind of a, a, an easy uh, opportunity for uh, distributors like Palace to you know, fill their cinemas without uh, uh, too much of of a risk. Um, but having said that, uh, I think that uh, audiences are continuously seeking something different and. You know, as Russell was saying with the Korean uh, films, that, you know, that there's so many different stories out there uh, that are so unlike anything that we see in other cinemas that, you know, the, um, uh, I think you know, that's what audiences are seeking. And that's why I think that there's going to be a rise in, uh, in, in numbers for film festivals with, with, a, um, with, with a unique voice like the, the, the Korean and, and uh, perhaps others will. You know, it is really a competitive market, that, that film festival. Um, and so, you know, Korea may be flavour of the, the year for one year, uh, but it's highly competitive. So, you know, it is, of course, risky. You know, the, the following year, it may be Turkey, it may be Iran again, it may be, you know, a, a, a tiny nation that, um, that, that becomes um, potent. So, and, you know, not all these nations, like Georgia's got, you know, a tiny uh, film industry, but virtually every film that they make is fantastic. They don't have a national film festival. Should they have one? Well, that's perhaps where the Sydney or the Melbourne Film Festival, you know, um, fulfills its its role, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, on the topic of uh, breaking stereotypes, um, do you, uh, uh, as you mentioned, was one of the big roles for um, Resurrection Russia, Russia Resurrection Film Festival. Um, how do you feel that that is achieved? Film by uh, showing diverse genres, or because I believe that some films actually work to heighten the stereotypes. Um, so for, for for Korean cinema as well, and I'm not saying all Korean films do this. Um, but, uh, you get your rom com, and then you get your you know uh, heartbreak, uh, and all these genres and topics, which kind of um, maybe ingrain the idea that all Korean romances are like this. Um, do you, does that kind of, in the perspective of programming a film festival, do those notions kind of factor in? Yeah, of course, I mean, we know that historical costume dramas are the most popular. And if we show War and Peace all eight hours of again, we'll fill up the, the cinema again. Um, but and we, we kind of try to balance that with programming films that will be popular, and we know that uh, Russian rom-coms, uh, which are you know, very different to Korean ones, and will be you know, really uh, worthy uh, subject for uh, comparative research, um, and you know, they're incredibly popular with our female audience, and we, we found one thing that is that we need to please the, the Russian women in the audience, because um, if they're not happy, no one's going to be happy. Um, <laughs> And I know this from personal experience. So, in a, in a sense, that we we program um, bearing in mind our uh, female uh, audience. Of course, we work with stereotypes, but we're also responding to the best films that, that come out of Russia in in that particular year. You know, Russia's not um, doesn't make nearly as many films as Korea, but still, you know, uh, out of two hundred films, you, you're still trying to uh, pick the the best. We're trying to be a little bit provocative. We we do get some money from the Russian government, but we're totally independent. Uh, and we've run into trouble with the embassy, and sometimes that creates some good publicity. But you know, when uh, when you know you sort of you know kick back against uh, expected government censorship. So, yeah, of course that you, you work with stereotypes, but really, you know, uh, I think our audience would be um, would be disappointed if we just went for the sort of stereotypical films because sometimes they're, they're not great films. Um, and so we're trying to push the boundaries of what is expected about um, Russia. Um, you know, for Australians, I think over 16 years, people's uh, expectations and knowledge of Russia have changed because they've been attending the, the Russian Film Festival. They, they know so much more about uh, Russia. So I think it's about being provocative in your programming. Yeah, it's a very fine line, I believe, yeah, that we kind of have to tether towards. Uh, 
Yeah, yes. If I could, I mean, you know, there's a kind of danger about when we talk about stereotypes, which cinema often deals with, but also the thing, there is such a thing as national character as well, you know, and not everyone has that. Um, and there's often enough, you know, characteristics that are familiar that perpetuate the stereotypes and what have you. And one of the things that I've always loved about Korean film um, is that, you know, there is an authenticity to Korean films. So that the people, the Koreans I meet are reflected in the cinema. So when I'm seeing not all Korean films, not, not everyone that acts like, you know, um, uh, Cho Min Sik and the old boy or something, you know, but, but the thing is, there's an authenticity that's kind of going, yeah, I recognise that. I know that. And, you know, and I think that's one thing that helps people connect with films, whether it's their own national cinema, but also internationally as well. And it's also that thing of, because the emotions and the behaviours are so authentic, that even if you've never been to Korea, you've never met a Korean, and what have you, that somehow as an audience you kind of pick up on that, that this is the real deal. You know, so I often use the example, well, the two examples I use, uh, Japanese, contemporary Japanese cinema, with the exception of Coriander, um, completely disconnected from the Japanese people that I know. Um, and Australian cinema, you know, like, I don't know about you people, but when I see most of these Australian films, I'm like, who the fuck are these people? You know, I just don't know who they are. You know, I don't connect with it. Whereas I believe in the set, and every national, well, not every national cinema, but national cinemas do kind of um, rise up and fall away. Italians and the Swedes in the 50s, Australia in the 70s. The amazing thing for me about Korean cinema is that it peaked, well, it started to peak in the late 90s, and it has maintained a status at the festival level, at the domestic level, at the, and I attribute that mainly to the authenticity of the films. Yeah, it's funny actually, you're saying that, oh god, the authenticity of Korea in cinema, if that's the case, half the ones I've seen are all about serial killers, gangsters, or people <laughs> running down the streets having car chases, like, I don't want to go there if that's the case. <laughs> uh, but no, it's great because many of the Korean films I've seen, cinemas at least ever since I got into the whole national cinema, have been pretty much action films, genre films, and historical films. So what was it? This festival, you know, this year itself got like what the Odd Family last night, Take Point, you know, coming up on Friday, I believe, and then A Resistance, which was our opening film. So pretty much the actual programming of the Korean Film Festival, at least every year that I've been a part of it really have actually had those three pillars all throughout. So it actually is a good representative like snapshot of what Korean cinema is trying to convey. And there's very well human emotions, especially from the historical cinema, just getting out there and actually exposing audiences to well, what they've been through. So since I got into well, my studies of Korean cinema, I didn't know anything, but I didn't know the Japanese occupation that even occurred. So it was because of these films, because of programming such as this, that I was even able to get into that, to actually acknowledge what the nation had been through and actually well, somewhat empathize, sympathize, get on board with it all, thanks to what was being portrayed in these films. So yeah, that's a personal take on that one. Definitely. And um, before we, I guess, hand over the questions to the audience, I guess, uh, the last question, and this is open to all the panelists that I would like to talk about is, yeah, briefly touch on the potential future for Korean cinema. Where do we go from here? Um, this could be maybe next year or even a hundred years on. But from this point on, what should we be focusing on? Um, where should we be going? And your know, projections for how we would uh, I guess, advance for the next 100 years would be most appreciated. Well, um, as I said uh, at the beginning, I'd like to see a sidebar of really bad Korean films, like, you know, maybe midnight screenings of, you know, the, the worst of <laughs> Korean cinema. But uh, seriously, um, the one of the first Korean films that really, really touched me was The Ox, and I'd like to see more documentary, um, you know, maybe sort of a stream of, um, of um, cinematic documentaries that um, I, I think that you know that aspect of authenticity was um, would probably be even more highlighted in the documentary sphere. Yeah no, it's fine because at least in my studies I've been noticing at least over the last 10 or so years that the link between South Korean cinema and Hollywood cinema have been getting very close 
For instance, I believe I was a Park Chan Wook, you know, Bong Joon Ho, and Kim Ji Woon all had their English language Hollywood debuts in 2013, with Stoker, Snowpiercer, and The Last Stand, respectively. Now, some were admittedly more successful than others. I mean, who actually remembers The Last Stand, honestly? But you do, great. But no, decent film. But the fact of the matter is that they were at least trying to come across. And now with the advent of Netflix, uh, they basically, I think they actually fully funded Opcha. Uh, Warner Brothers fully funded uh, The Age of, Shad uh, Age of Shadows, sorry, and Il Yang the Wolf Brigade. So there is that crossover that Hollywood is now, well, fully producing South Korean films. And the Age of Shadows is a very Korean narrative, yet it was funded by an American company. It kind of just blew my mind when I first saw that. But along those lines, I feel that there is some cohesion starting to occur that hopefully over the next hundred years, maybe, I don't know, not saying a fusion, but maybe taken in, well, the budgets, the overall narratives, the themes, hopefully might have some cross between, well, hopefully revitalize the Hollywood film industry in some regard, and maybe even make the budget and spectacle of Korean cinema maybe increase in its own right. I mean, we even saw it, what, this year with the John Wick 3. We even had that big, motorcycle chase, a sword, sort of tunnel. I was like, that's the villainess. They ripped off the villainess. It's like, so they were heavily inspired by South Korean cinema, what they've actually achieved, and hopefully they might, have, well, be a bit of a symbi symbiosis, hopefully, have some form of, well, cohesion to help them both go forward, make them better, hopefully. But yeah. Uh, from, from another point, my, um, I would focus on, um, the production itself, uh, not, not the film, but the process of production. Uh, apparently, um, the second most th uh, phrase that Bong Joon-ho said while he was um, directing Parasite was um, after cut. So cut was the, the number one thing that he said. Is number two was what time is lunch? <laughs> um, and the reason that he said that wasn't because he was hungry, or he just wanted to get out of there. It was because he wanted to bring in a more of a Hollywood style of production where the workers are treated equally, fairly. They were given, um, they were given um, certain hours, the contractual hours that they could only work. So the fair work um, and uh, fair pay, those sorts of things. Um, and mes many people will know Korea is known for you know, um, great modernity, um, economic development, um, technology and so on. But what goes on behind there is the people um, that are suffering, the laborers that are suffering, the workers, the editors, um, even in um, dramas or um, variety shows, there are the, the staff that are being worked overtime that can't sleep, are being paid little or have very little um, job security, uh, but are sort of forced to work in that um, in the field. And what Bong Joon-ho and many people that have actually worked in Hollywood or have acted in Hollywood, uh, when they come back, they all say the Hollywood system is great. Um, you know, they've got you know, everyone's like treated equally. You know, you don't have to work overtime if you don't you know, if you're not contracted to. And so uh, I think Bong Joon-ho is trying to take that first step to bring that into Korea. Now I believe that it will be very difficult for it to be implemented um, nationwide for every single um, film. But I think unless it does really catch on, uh, I think um, Korean cinema might be at a state where. Um, Talented people, either actors or directors, just leave the field because it's just unbearable. Um, and so, for Korea to have a bright future, I believe that even though it's going to be difficult, um, there needs to be a more of a, um, um, I'd say, more of a workers' rights, not just for the directors, but for the workers, not just for the actors, but for you know, um, the cameraman, sound, the lighting, everyone. And um, unless that is achieved at a certain level, um, I, I, my, I, I'm sort of hesitant to say that Korea will continue to develop at the pace that it has up to this point. Yeah, I think uh, it, the country is, I mean, my personal uh, reflections, is it's gone through such a huge economic boost. There is no denying that what we, we or Korea has achieved in 50 years is nothing short of a miracle. And what the people are doing now are trying to get the ideologies and the mental fi fabrics and fibers to catch up to that economic growth. And um, Dr. Bong Joon-ho and 
um, a lot of these uh, pioneers would probably set the, paved the way for other other directors to follow. And yeah, I'd like to see this as a very optimistic uh, trend that will definitely take place. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to follow up on John's point because it's really interesting because a lot of the um, particularly the filmmakers of the nineties and into the early kind of two thousands, a lot of these filmmakers were leftists and what have you, and very much about the, the minjuk, the people and all that kind of stuff. But when they became the director, if there's a reason they're called directors, <laughs> you know, it's kind of that kind of controlled hierarchy starts to come into play. And what you're saying is that Bong Joon Ho is um, trying to develop a system where the politics of the people is actually reflected in the process of how films are made. And I hope that's true, but there's always people out there you know, who are hungry to make film and will sell their friends and their relatives down the river to make sure that they can get something up on the that, screen. That's, that's what I'm fearing, yeah. Well, uh, if you know Korea, Korea is uh, a great country. Uh, beautiful people, uh, beautiful um, places, um, lovely people. Um, but as um, our host mentioned, it has had that um, really rapid economic growth from one of the poorest countries um, after the um, Korean War, now um, into um, one of the world leaders. The economy, uh, the economy has grown, people's wages have grown, but their mentality hasn't. So their mentality is still catching up. And so um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's what we, you're, you're saying. And um, what Pong Joon-ho, I think, want, wants to do is bridge that gap so that you make a, um, the working environment for the people to be a uh, place where you want to go and work. You know? Well, today's shooting day, let's go and work, rather than, oh, I have to stay. I have to um, stay up all night again today. You know what I'm saying? And if you get more workers like that um, who are uh, hesitant to actually step in the field because of the harsh working conditions, that means that you've got these brilliant, potentially brilliant people that are leaving the field. Um, and so I think if you make the working conditions better for the Korean cinema, I think it will bring about a, um, uh, a newer renaissance for the Korean cinema. And hopefully we'll see this new um, renaissance, which will definitely be talked about by um, our panel here uh, 10, 20 years from now. Hopefully we could have a reunion. <laughs> and we could definitely talk about the trends back then as well. Um, I would like to now open up the questions to the audience. If anybody has a question, just please raise your hand. And what I'll do is run over and give you the mic. So uh, just a show of hands. If you, yep, turn around the back, I will run to you. Hi, um, I've just started getting into Korean stuff and K-drama and all that. I'm just wondering to the gentleman from Queensland University, um, do you think there are any things that are kind of reflected more in kind of mainstream or um, like TV dramas and all that that are not as much shown in Korean films? I mean, like in terms of kind of things about Korean society and um, you know contemporary issues. Yeah, um, I think we were uh, before this started. We just had a little chat, um, and I, I said that um, in Korean film, you usually find that male male um, uh, characters are the dominant characters. Whereas in Korean drama, you'll find that it's actually the female characters that are usually the dominant characters. And um, I think the reason is that film is short; and you can only tell a short story in a, sh a brief period of time. Whereas dramas actually go on for um, you know, 16 episodes, 32 episodes, or 50 episodes, something, 100 episodes. And so it needs to revolve around life. It needs to revolve around family. And I think Korea has come to a, a position where um, it, in society, um, it might not be economically, but in society, um, there are many people that are saying it's no longer a patriarchal society, it's more of a matriarchal society because the women, um, you know, you know, happy wife, happy life, that sort of thing. Um, and they've got the women working in the, field, uh, in the, in the workplace as well. And so it's the women, uh, especially in the household, that are uh, the dominant. And I think that is sort of uh, revealed in Korean drama. And I don't think that has been really um, reflected on in Korean cinema, the, the realities of, especially um, 
I think the most com one of the most common themes of Korean drama is the uh, the relationship between um, the in-laws, especially the wife and the mother-in-law. Uh, that relationship is very um, uh, it's complicated, and um, I think it's it's something that cannot be explained in uh, a two-hour film, and that can only be done as it's uh, revealed through. 20, 30, 50 hours. And the Korean public actually watch it and they can relate to it. Whereas Korean films, if it's released in, uh, if it's, uh, for example, if it's a film that um, is about the, the, the conflicts between the, uh, the in-laws, if it was released in Australia for the, um, the festival, people would be like, but why are they fighting all the time? <laughs> uh, and, and so I think uh, in that regard, I think film has, I think film has yet to catch up to the realisms of uh, Korean society. Uh, of course, there are great aspects of Korean society or real aspects in there as well, but um, I think there are differences. And I think if you want to know a little bit about the realistic uh, portrayals of Korean lives, I think Korean drama is a way to go, it, uh, go about it, except for the love stories. The, the Korean love stories in dramas are very unlikely, the Cinderella stories. Um, but the daily lives, I think, is um, far more realistic in Korean drama than writing Korean film. Okay, um, does anyone else have a pressing question? Yes, gentlemen from the front. Hi, so I'm sorry this is covered because I stepped in a bit late. Now, uh, I spent most of my youth in America exposed to Die Hard, Back to the Future, etc. So when it got into Korea in the mid-90s, uh, when I saw this, all these romantic based movies, I was kind of bored. And then when Shiri came out in 99, it was an absolute big boot for me as a film watcher, and it was a reflection of the box office. Now, that happened in Korea 20 years ago. What for you, all four panel members, was the film that got you interested in Korean drama, and what you think might be the, um, lack of a better term, international breakthrough, point, and why that appealed to international audiences? Question. I'll, I'll pick up on that because I did refer to Shiri and how it was a new story and, and what have you. And, uh, and as I said, you know, the film for me that really put the hook in, the hook in me was that Yim Young says, Nowhere to Hide. And, and, you know, and this is a film that divides people. Um, but the thing is that this film travelled the film festival circuit quite widely. It played the New York Film Festival and played quite widely. And, but the bizarre thing was that Im Yong was from the generation before, and it was the filmmakers like Park Chan Wook uh, and Kim Ki Duk and uh, you know others uh, that they got to kind of talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. They got to move on and carry with JSA. Um, JSA was a big breakthrough in lots of ways because of its performance at the Berlin Film Festival. It was very very widely um, uh, admired there. And the host, of course, is the thing. And it's, you know, but it's, um, for me personally, it was nowhere to hide, you know, and it's just so stylized, so beautiful, and yet, you know, Emil says he'd make another film for almost 10 years after that. Yeah, it was a really kind of, it's just one of those uh, misfortunes of the way the film industry works. Yeah. So, I mean, as I was saying in my introduction, pretty much Old Boy was the one that got me into all of this. But the reason why I even thought to look up Old Boy at all was that it had that international breakthrough. Like, I was subscribed to Empire magazine, I believe, at the time, and that was Australia's like, largest film magazine or whatever. But they were using that as the one of the best comic book movies of all time. So I was like, okay, check that out, watch it, here we are. And then to this day, pretty much the hallway scene with you know him biting what, 20 guys with a hammer. That is pretty much always referenced, especially in my film classes. If anyone knows about Korean cinema at all, that is the scene they keep referencing. You put up the image and people know what we're talking about. It is that iconic. So in a way, for me, at least you know, up until well, Parasite came out, the quintessential Korean film internationally would have been Old Boy. I mean, it being the giant splash when it came out in 2004, it won the Grand Prix prize, I think, at the Venice Film Festival. So yeah, it made a big splash. It hooked people in from all walks of life and pretty much got them in. So at least that's how I believe it anyway. Yeah. And I do believe actually Parasite itself might be that new old boy. They actually have that international cross appeal. But yeah, I mean, I just want to kind of 
underline that because old boy, you know, was at Khan the year that Quentin Tarantino was on the jury, and there was very much a talk that Tarantino pushed for old boy in a very big way, and that certainly spread it across the world. And, and, and it brought the film to attention. There's no doubt about that. From from my perspective, mine's a bit different. But the, the the documentary The Ox really moved me, and I, I think the only reason I went along to it was that one of the, the sort of marketing headlines, the biggest film in Korea of this year, and I thought, wow, oh, just curious. Uh, but then, you know, virtually every year I've seen a film that has moved me, excited me, and, and shifted my perceptions, and um, perhaps the, the one that sticks with me the, the most is uh, Sea Mist, or Sea Fog. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, how, how's that translated? Yeah, no, I believe it's called elsewhere. Sorry? Heyman? Heyman, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that blew me away. It's uh, such a sophisticated, complex story with so many twists. And kind of, you know, like, I look at this and I, uh, at Korean cinema, and I'm really jealous because I wish Russians were making films like the Koreans. Russians <laughs> make great films. Yeah, but come on. Okay. Don't be modest. <laughs> Heyman was actually written by Bong Joon-ho. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my, um, my first interaction with Korean film in Australia uh, was actually Oasis. Um, I don't know why, but my I think it was like the first time a Korean film was uh, shown in Brisbane. I was long, long time ago. I don't even remember because I was so young. But my parents took me. I saw it. I was in the cinema. With, um, it was filled with Koreans because I think all the Koreans were excited that they could watch a Korean film in Australia. Uh, I saw it. Uh, I was young. I was too young to understand anything. Um, um, if you've seen Oasis, Oasis it's a... It's it's not a story that a young child or or, or someone in um you know, in uh, early high school years can really take, uh, but I watched it. Uh, that was it. But then years later, I uh, came across it again. I watched it again, um, and then um, from a mature age, you could really understand um, uh, what the story was about and and why it was uh, wildly popular and why it was actually brought to Brisbane to be uh, shown. And so yeah, uh, I think it was Oasis to begin, uh, which I didn't understand at that time. But yeah, so for me, Oasis. Okay, um, so I hope that helped answer the question. I think we have time for one last question. So, okay, you go first. Um, so just the thing that I've been noticing recently is that um, Korean films that tend to get glorified in Western um, film festivals tend to be the ones that are commercially less popular in Korea and a bit um, detached from popular Korean ideology. What do you think might be the danger in that? Can you give us a couple of so titles like, of what films so, you're talking so about? So as in like The Handmaiden or Burning or even The Parasite, you know, um, one thing that I noticed about Parasite personally was that it didn't really um, so it sort of gives a little downturn on the whole um, struggle for um, becoming rich and it sort of um, doesn't really honor by, honor, honor, um, by the idea of um, really trying, which is an idea that is, um, is, is reflected in Korean popular ideology. So um, what I'm sort of thinking is that these Western films that um, win all these awards uh, with uh, these Korean films that win all these Western awards are uh, like um, these ones that tend to, um, as you mentioned before, um, catch up with Western thought, which um, may not <coughs> be ingrained as yet deep in Korean society. Um, if there is a... So Korean um, audience have different ideas of um, films that get awards in um, Western society. Um, what sort, what um, ties do you think can be made to amend that? I think, um, like Kim Gidok Street Iron, um, that had like, I think about 20,000, uh, 200,000, I think, mm. in a country where apparently Korea has the highest per capita um, views um, to the cinema. So 200,000 is very little. Yeah, yeah. But Kim Gidok Street Iron was internationally well accepted. But the Koreans didn't like it. I mean, I, I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kim Ki Duk and Three Iron in particular. Like one of the reasons that Three Iron um, was didn't have much dialogue is Kim Ki Duk 
was aiming for a Western market and felt that the dialogue, you know, Korean dialogue would hold him back. He thought less dialogue, it'll be more open to the Western market. So I mean, I think that's an example of the filmmaker, you know, specifically aiming for a Western market. But you know, like The Handmaiden, um, which is based on a Western book, you know, um, but The Handmaiden was a box office hit, you know, for, it was number one in the box office for a couple of weeks, two, maybe three, maybe four weeks in, in, in Korea. Um, you know, I, I mean, Parasite's a bit different because would Parasite have done so well if it hadn't won the prize at Cannes? You know, it's kind of, um, it's hard to say. And, you know, I mean, I think, but, you know, there's other films, we were talking about romantic comedies before, you know, before we started, one of it. And, you know, My Boyfriend is Type B, for example, is never going to go, never going to be selected for a film festival, you know? Um, My Sassy Girl is a really good example of where a film was picked up by the West and China as well. Apparently the word sassy um, became a very uh, popular word in China because of that. Um, film. So, you know, there are some films that kind of will cross over, but, you know, I, I mean, there's always going to be a, a difference, you know, like, and it happens in Australia too. So, you know, we've got, I, I don't know, like the, the last number one, this top end wedding maybe, you know, not going to get selected for international film festivals, you know, but very popular here. A lot of the films that are popular here would never be shown outside this country, you know. So, I mean, I think there is, it's a different selection process and a wider audience and what have you. I think it's also a combination of, um, um, first of all, uh, Koreans are really quick to jump on the bandwagon. Um, so if it becomes... Stereotypes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm a Korean, so I can say it. I, I can say Fair it. Call. Yeah, Fair yeah, call. I'm a Korean, so. Um, for example, um, Interstellar. That was uh, really, really well received in Korea. And apparently it was probably like one of the very few countries it was actually really well received, uh, received regardless of how great the film it was. Um, because some people started posting on Instagram or, or Facebook, it's a great film, go watch it, it's mind blowing. And so people just quickly um, share these things and they're like, oh, let's go watch it to sell it. Um, I think Parasite is uh, another example of that. Um, I remember actually was um, reading a newspaper and it had um, the first number, uh, the first perfect film, well not perfect film, but first five star film of the year. And I went, I clicked it and it was Parasite. And um, would that have been there if it hadn't won um, at the Cannes Film Festival? I don't think so. But I think people like to jump on that bandwagon because it did so well at this uh, international film festival. Um, as a um, as an audience, you want to go watch it because everyone else is doing it. I think that's sort of the, the mood of, of today. When someone else is doing it, you want to do it. But, um, but in Korea, I think there's also um, the ideological aspect as well. Is that uh, many of these Bong Joon-ho films, uh, like The Host, Memories of Murder, um, uh, Snowpiercer, uh, Okja, and then uh, Parasite, they, uh, they, they deal with um, either political, ideological, or economical um, uh, difficulties or crisis. And uh, that's why some people like to label Bong Joon-ho as being a left, a left wing. And that's why the Korean um, general public, as in like not the film goers itself, as, uh, don't really accept his ideology because Korea is a heavily democratic capitalist society that borders, shares its border with communist North Korea. Um, and so I think Bong Joon-ho in that regard uh, in Korea might not do well uh, if it wasn't for his name, if it wasn't for his name label, if it wasn't for um, his brilliance, I think the themes of his films might not be very um, pr- uh, say accepted by the Koreans, um, especially today. There's just a, another kind of point, another film that I'm thinking of is the um, Welcome to uh, Don you know, which was, you know, when that film came out, all the Western eyes were on the fact that Park Chan Wook's third film, Sympathy for Lady Vengeance, the Vengeance trilogy, it was going to play at Venice, and everyone was like, "We're going. This is going. This film is going to go gangbusters." And then Welcome to Don McCall, and I was in Korea when this happened. Welcome to Don McCall came out, and it 
just went through the roof. And it was like the whole of Korea just said, oh, we've done two of these vengeance films, we're not doing a third one. Yeah, whereas the West kind of very centered on that. And when it, at the special screening in Pusan, they showed Welcome to Don McCall, you know, like I was with other Westerners, it was my first chance to see it and what have you, and it just didn't connect at all. You know? And a lot of it has to do with the voice and the accent and, and the thing that goes on in that film. And you know, some films just don't cross over. That, it's just kind of the, the way it is. Yeah. Okay, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, in this short, or well, if you consider an hour a little long, but for me, I felt that it was very short. And uh, in the time that we've been together, I hope that we've been able to kind of get a lot more scope on the present, uh, the past, present, and future of Korean cinema. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I'd just like to uh, point out that our film festival, the Korean Film Festival in Australia, is running today as well um, until the 31st of August. So. We, look, we very much look forward to seeing you at our cinema at Dendi Opera Keys, which is just across the water. Um, so if you can swim across um, <laughs> 2 p.m., we've got Parasite happening, and I do anticipate that that will be a very popular screening. Also, owing to the fact that it's been mentioned so many times in our forum just today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could we please give a round of applause for our panelists today? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.